Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to JJ Meets World. Our guest today is Kevin Wallivan, a real live journalist. We get to talk about broadcast history, what it's like to archive your life, and most importantly, all of the great stories he's been able to capture on footage over the years. Plus, Tucker and I talk about Tab Cola. And if you're looking for a delicious Tab Cola, apparently somebody drank all of it because we can't find any of it anymore. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World. One, two, three, four. JJ Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always sniffing out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. JJ has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called JJ Meets World. I was walking by a recycling bin the other day and it was full of aluminum cans and they were all tab. Someone drank enough tab that they filled up one of those alu- like boxes for recycling aluminum. And I thought to myself, I've never even had a tab. Have you ever had tab? Oh, yeah. Have, Have you, you really? Yeah. I've also had like our family brand colas that they used to dispense Yeah, I mean, I've had Walmart. Dr. Thunder. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. had off-brand undesirable sodas. But sure. But Tab isn't an off-brand. It's a brand of its own it's that I think is just- brandish is- enough. I mean, if you're not a Coke or Pepsi product, like, like, like understandably, then I think you could be- RC Cola is a brand, but I'd call that off-brand. See, I when I think of off-brand, I think of someone just trying to imitate another popular brand. So, for example, Hydrox- is an off brand of Oreo, even though technically it came first. It came first. Oreo just did it better. It's 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 where it's seen as the lesser version. Right. The lesser. But now that I say that, I bet RC Cola is probably owned by Coke or something, and I'm just saying Maybe. that. I don't know who owns Tab. All I know is I've never had a Tab. Were they different flavors of Tab then? No, they were all like a pinkish can. I don't so know. I don't know if that's like pink lemonade or ta- something. Or I hope I don't, not. no idea. I assumed so. Tab is a brown cola, isn't it? Eh? It's a cola. Well, if it's a cola, it's brown, right? Right. I don't. You I don't tell know. Me, I, I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> I don't know about tab. Uh, and I, I consider myself a pretty worldly gentleman. I've had. Uh, I've had Coke in other countries. Coca Cola. Oh, I understand yeah, okay. what you're saying. In other as, countries, as context by the soda right. talk before it, uh, where they use different like real sugar cane right. and stuff like that. Although someone told me that if you drink Coca-Cola in the southern part of the United States, it's sweetened with sugar cane versus up here it's sweetened with like I've beet sugar. I've been told that too. I'm not sure if it's true, but it Neither might do, be. I don't know. You know, for two indoor kids, you'd think we'd have a much better grasp of tab and mm-hmm. what it tastes like and who makes it. Just last week, I tried to do what I did when I was in like sixth grade and I ordered a Domino's pizza and I got a two liter of Mountain Dew. And I thought, I'm going to stay up all night playing video games. <laughs> and Did you get a tummy ache? I almost immediately. <laughs> and I was asleep by like 945. Yep. I said to myself, hmm, <laughs> if, if, six, if sixth grade JJ saw me today, he'd be like, that dude can't party, but I bet he's kissed a girl. Hey, the, the thing you need to have, though, is what the, what is the thing you're avoiding by doing it? That's what makes it fun. So if it's like, oh, I'm going to be really tired for school tomorrow, <laughs> you know, that makes it fun that you stayed up all Versus night. Or like, oh, I'm going to be really tired for that trip to Costco tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Soccer practice tomorrow is not going to go well. Uh, I am constantly reminded that I'm not, a spring chicken anymore and i think sometimes people s- claim to be old and you're not really old but life changes and life kind of throws you for a curveball sometimes right. and your priorities change and not that you had bad priorities before but certain things like you know making sure that you're somewhere on time changes for you um and when you think about how much things have changed in your life, you look at a picture of yourself when you're in sixth grade versus what you are today. On Facebook, the big thing is what you look like 10 years ago. You, you we're, It's neat because Facebook has kind of provided us with this modern day archive yeah, of that's who true. we are. That's true. You're getting reminders um, of on this day five years ago, this right. happened. 
And I'm reminded about how like unfunny I was in 2012. That was a bad year for me, but like 2009 and, and subsequent years were great. Our guest today is Kevin Wallivan, and we talk extensively about the art and craft of archiving and the importance of it. Uh, Kevin, of course, is one of the most respected journalists of his time in our region. Yeah, he's one of the primary storytellers of this region, for sure. And, and storytelling is absolutely correct. Uh, at, in fact, we talk a lot about the documentaries that he's made. Uh, we talk about getting to uh, work with some really amazing individuals, to work for a company that has allowed him to do so many uh, great things over the years, and about how poor he is it, as a mechanic. <laughs> he was also very gracious because, because of me, we were actually about 40 minutes late in recording this thing because I was too busy at an auto mechanic shop getting ripped off. Mm -hmm. And then he started his, he starts a story about a mechanic. And so it's like how meta we are right now. Um, I think you folks are really going to enjoy this episode. I think you're also going to immediately finish this episode and want to seek out some of Kevin's stuff online because it's top quality, top notch stuff. And it is that living archive yep. of where we are in our, uh, in our world. Also, this is the first chance to tell you that uh, this podcast is brought to you by Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. You can go to livefargomorehead.com and uh, seek Natalie out. She is fantastic when it comes to buying or selling your home. Uh, she even is uh, a former line bender. I guess once a line bender, always a line bender. And so she's funny to talk to as well. So you get a you get an entertainer and a real estate agent out of the mix. Thank you so much to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Real Estate for sponsoring our podcast, JJ Meets World. You guys can also go to patreon.com and send us a couple bucks uh, just for that too so that we can do some stuff. I finally figured out how to put something onto an actual cassette tape. And so get ready. In February, Patreon, uh, not subscribers, Patreon patrons. Is that what you say? Patreon patrons? I'm going to send you a cassette tape of a special edition episode of JJ Meets World that you can only access via cassette tape. It's going to be awesome. Now sit back, relax, and listen to our great conversation with Kevin Wallivan. JJ Meets World. Uh, Kevin Wallivan, welcome to JJ Meets World. Happy to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let's dig into this uh, right off the bat. So tell us how you got into the world of journalism. Probably since we were talking about auto repair. I realized early on I was a failure at it. My dad, my dad had a a, a gas station, filling station, tow truck uh, operation, and uh, so my brother and I, and all of my cousins for that matter, worked there. So we're talking the '70s, and then um, later on, my cousins worked there in the '80s. But um, it was kind of like the only shop in town, and uh, my job was strictly um, tires and pumping gas. I was horrible at everything else. I could change oil. Um, so it was, this was a full service station yes. then? Oh, and still is. You, you, it's still pumped. The, really? the gas is still pumped for you. Yeah. And um, But back then, um, you know, was a lot of, uh, before, you know, computers and everything. So it was a lot of water pumps, fuel pumps, install batteries, uh, radiators, and all that stuff. But I just sucked at it. Uh, my brother was pretty handy. <laughs> So I was strictly tires, oil changes, and and gas, and then um, and I even was pretty horrible at that too. In, in fact, once I left a tool, <laughs> yeah, it, with a tire you put the tire on the machine and you fix the hole, and then you put it the tire back on the rim. And we're back. I'm back backing out the car. And my dad says, "Stop, stop!" I'd left a tool inside the tire, and you could hear it clunk clunk. <laughs> as the car was being backed out and he's like get it back in here because i'd left the, the tool in there and just other things I, I replaced spark plugs once for in a car and i was putting them in upside down was breaking the porcelain on the spark plug so <laughs> my father knew early on this kid is not an heir to the uh amico name so yeah and i grew up in otter tail county and then came to uh then MSU, and I went right into uh, communications broadcast stuff. W when I grew up in Ottertail, we had one TV station, and that was out of Alexandria. We, we got no Fargo stations. In fact, we didn't even get public TV. Wow. So we got a station called KCMT 
out of Alec, which kind of served Lakes Country. And um, I, w- you know, I was I was really drawn to current events, so Vietnam War, Watergate stuff. Um, and I think it's just because my parents we'd be be eating dinner and that TV was on in another room. We didn't have one in the kitchen, but a black and white Zenith. And I remember watching that stuff and, and fascinated by the Vietnam war, the fighting in Northern Ireland. I I distinctly remember that. And so current events was interesting to me. I used to imitate, um, reporters. I'd pretend I was like doing stand up. I'd have a, I'd have a cardboard box for an anchor desk. Um, and it's funny because I used to imitate an NBC guy. His name was Irving R. Levine. And he did all the NBC business stories. Pretty boring guy. Bald guy. His name was Irving R. Levine. Had a funny way of talking. I later met his <laughs> kid at the Y. He was clerking at the federal courthouse. Really? Yeah. You're like, you got to hear my impression. Should I do it? Yeah. I, yes, please. Yeah, Can you like, still do it? Oh, yeah. Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Washington. It was kind of a, it was like the old school radio and sing songy. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was bad. And, he's, and you know, wasn't the greatest writer. So were you like a kid who had like, like Cronkite up on the wall as a poster instead of Michael Jordan or something? I or? was back then. It was Brinkley Huntley. Okay. Sure. Because we didn't even get uh, Cronkite okay. station. So we were strictly David Brinkley and and uh, and Huntley, and yeah. And, you know, black and white, you know, bad, bad TV <laughs> in those days. You but. know, kids today will never appreciate how when you turned off the TV, it took a second for it to, like, actually yes. disappear. Ew. And how it, yeah, it would go down to, you know, the dot. Or when you turned it on, how it kind of came to be. It just right. didn't suddenly flash on. And think of that. And, and how you would wait for that. You know what I mean? I actually just recently rebuilt my what I call my analog station at home. Wow! Because I've got a, a, an old uh, Ikigami actual like uh, broadcast right. monitor that I got from DAY. They just thrown it away one right. day, and then I use it to hook up like my old Nintendo, and I watch that's VHS tapes funny. off of it. And then that's in the same unit with like my record player that also plays tapes and stuff. So I actually have now. Uh, all the stuff that I, at one point when I was younger, I put away because I thought, well, this isn't the new cool stuff. Now we right. want the new digital stuff. But now I've brought it back because, you know, you play an old Sega Genesis game on a flat screen TV. It doesn't look the way it exactly. was supposed to look. Yeah. So I think that stuff's coming back. I think Seer TVs are going to be back in style. I just bought an old school uh, uh, record player. Like a, it has legs and everything. Nice. Really? From the 50s. Threw on a Ray Price record yesterday. A Ray Price <laughs> record, too, yeah. huh? I only have one side because the other side has some kind of, I don't know what on it. <laughs> and uh, so it's slightly damaged, but I got the good side. Isn't it amazing how there is a cycle to technology that yeah. people just did not see coming? The, the the music industry did not ever think that vinyl was going to come back. Crazy. We and have a, now I mean, it there's is. There's a store in town. Yeah. Or a couple. Yep. yep. Oh, and yeah. for Christmas, I bought my brother, not a tie, not hunting stuff. I bought him three used records from the 70s. Loved them. Yeah, I bet his eyes were as big as saucers when he opened them. Like, oh. so ex- and there, there's an excitement to this old school technology. Just today, somebody gave me a cassette tape. <laughs> and they said, is there any way that you can get what's on this mm. onto something I could actually listen to today? Interesting. And I said, well, you could go buy a $300 used car, and that probably has a tape <laughs> yeah. player in it. Uh, and so even going into the bowels of uh, you know my technology, I finally found an old CD player that has a, a tape deck oh, in it, right. and it's got an actual auxiliary out, so I'll actually be able to turn this into a digital source for her. Serious. But Neat. what's the what are the odds that people still have stuff like that laying around? My dad still plays 8-track in his shop. No way. Are you serious? Kenny Rogers. Nice. Um, John Denver. I feel like if you're going to play 8-tracks, you have to have Kenny Rogers in oh, there. Yeah. That's a requirement you for an 8-track You decorated my life, <laughs> yeah. and- Coward of the, coward of the county. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is is his uh, John Denver like? Uh, uh, Thank God I'm a country boy. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rocky mm-hmm. Mountain High. <laughs> oh, that's good. So, uh, so you go to MSUM, right? And majored in uh, broadcast journalism, and that's when we started um, what's called Campus News, and that was the first 
television weekly show that MSU started. And it was for people wanting to get into news and broadcasting. So that was uh, my junior year that we started that. And it's still going. Um, ironically, I, uh, I'm an instructor over there for the students in the program now. Nice. So it's kind of full circle. But So that was the early 80s. And then interned at WDEY. And I started there in 83. And here I am, old and gray and ready for the home. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got some good stories left in you. I hope. Um, You're a silver fox. You got to yeah. get out there. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, talk to us a little bit about what the journey at WDAY has been like. Because you obviously didn't get to walk in and start doing what you're doing today. Right. Well, first of all, I had you know, some pretty good teachers. Um, people had stuck around there, uh, some of those who preceded me. And some of them were at the ground level of, of TV news in town. So that was, you know, pretty neat. So learning uh, photography. So I was shooting back then and then also reporting. So initially that very first year, I was interning for free um, <laughs> about 14 hours a day, Monday through Friday. And then I'd work for pay Saturday, Sunday. And then that transformed into a full-time job. And... Um, so to be honest, I've never really changed my description as a general assignment reporter, and that's kind of morphed into some documentary work and things like that. And I, I did the anchoring shtick early on. I was strictly like fifth string, you know, end of the bench if they really needed someone. It's like, all right, yeah, the, three people the, are on vacation. The, exactly. the weekenders are even on a Yeah, the ratings are really bad this week. Uh, let's put Wallowin in. <laughs> Um, but you know, I liked it. It was okay, but it was just not my, I think anchoring is a, is a beast of its own nature that right. people either have that skill set or yep. they don't. And I didn't mind it, but I, I have, I would be bored with it. It's I would not much necessarily rather... the same thing as, as full-time reporting, is it? Or oh, I, it's I don't so know different. how anchoring works necessarily. My, my ignorant view of it is that they are the person that is merely the one sort of giving it to us on TV, right. but they're not necessarily the ones writing the story, chasing down leads. Is that right. accurate? No. So in big cities, yes. Okay. So I have I have friends or, or students of mine that have gone on already to do some great things in big cities, and they kind of laugh about it because they show up at 4 o'clock and hang out, talk with their buddies, and then do the news, and then go home. So in the big markets, they don't do a lot of what we call producing. Here in town, it differs from shop to shop, but like our anchors come in at least four hours before the news, and they start what we call producing, meaning start writing the coming up next on whatever you'll see a story about. They write that. Okay. And then they determine the order of the show. Oh, interesting. Like, cool. Yeah. Okay. In some shops, they don't. They have just producers for that. And then the anchors come in and, you know, do other things. But so our anchors are pretty hands on. And um, in the but like in the big markets, they they're just uh, pretty faces. Yeah. They just make sure that their their tan looks regional right. and that the tie is straight, those type of things. Yeah. And in some of the bigger markets, I mean, we have consultants, too, that really dictate, you know, kind of a lot of what we do. But in some markets, Consultants are used like on a daily basis. Oh, sure. Like, what's what's your newscast look like? Hmm. No, don't do that. Change wow. this, change that. Um, hey, whatever you had on last night, don't wear that again. And tweak this in your hair. I mean, to that point, in some of the big markets, they have a much bigger say. In well, we're also seeing um, where large companies are buying up small news outfits all oh, over the yeah, country for millions of dollars. For millions, and then using that as basically a method to sort of spread in like a certain talking point or information. And you could go and take, uh, you know, 50 different news stations with their anchors standing there and then superimpose them on one on top of each other. And they're saying the exact same thing. Sinclair. And, and local, mm -hmm. the, yeah. you know, a uh, local, say, certainly uh, uh, older populations who, who really watch, who depend on local news because that's what they're used to, don't necessarily – understand that there's a difference now, that there's, oh, that's there's a true. different voice that they're getting. That's true. And in some cities, master control, meaning what we have second floor, is out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. And the show is is out of Wisconsin. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's how crazy it, it's gotten. I don't, I don't I've got know. a theory. Facebook just said that they're going to be putting something like $400 million into local broadcast. And what... The way they tried to spin it was saying, 
we're going to uh, help local journalists get national attention hmm. for the pieces that they're working on. When in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, okay, so you're going to plug money into places so that you've got news content that you don't have to create, you don't have to worry about, and you just pick and choose what what you like out of that, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess if you're looking for exposure and you want, you know, the Fargo's not the the end of the road for you if you're hoping to make it to one of those major markets or go right. to network or something, maybe that it's good for you. But I can't imagine that. On the local level, people are really chomping at the bit to get Facebook's approval for their stories. Agreed. I I don't see that being a success at all, and maybe I'm all wet on that, but I really don't. And if that's your goal as a reporter is to like get the heck out of here, you know, I'm I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, people who want to make a big splash and then and then move on and get out of here. It is it is interesting to watch people like leapfrog. I think people take Fargo as a market for granted mm-hmm. because they think, well, I'll just I'll start here and this is where I'll go. But you don't understand. You've got, I mean, you've got people in this town who've won Peabody's. You've got people in this town who are nationally respected. And when something like, uh, I think of like the flood of '97, where every media outlet in this city shined brighter than you can ever imagine. Yeah, when places like Good Morning America and the Today Show were talking to local camera people and to mm-hmm. local reporters right. about getting them to feed uh, some of their uh, footage video and video and back. Yeah. It just it, it amazes me, and I think we're very, very lucky. We talked about this on a previous podcast that Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo, Dilworth, I'll even throw Glendon in there, throw mm-hmm. Glendon a bone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there is, there's something really kind of amazing around here and there's still a chance for people to make their mark i would agree with that and there's plus there's so many great stories out there and you know when i think back to well every day we have to have a we have an editorial meeting we have to come to the table with like three viable story ideas that we know are going to work for that day and let's be on you know, you roll into work at 7.30, you maybe have one, and you have to really struggle to find two and three. But that's everyone having to do that. And, you know, we, we make it work. But there are uh, viewers, and you know that, but there's people out there that want to funnel you story ideas about yeah. this person and that person. I just, I got one when I was driving up here. I was in my car outside here because someone called and said, hey, there's a cool store in Detroit Lakes right up your alley. So you get that. So that's how you get story ideas. You, you know, if someone thinks that I'm coming up with cool stories every day, you're wrong because we get people feeding us good, good story ideas. And when you get old and gray, they're familiar with you, so they just tend to feed you stuff. Was you there, know what I mean? Was there a point, like a demarcation point in your career where you noticed, wow, I suddenly now have a reputation as a as a journalist and as a storyteller and as someone who – has access to a platform where suddenly you were getting more of a deluge of uh, people coming up to you saying, "Hey, here's a," uh, um, I, you know, I think in terms of like uh, um, Ronan Farrow, right? Who's who's mm-hmm. who's had a, a massive amount of big breaks in this Especially past the last, year, yeah, past the last year, year and, and a half. So because of him, and now because his career has gotten to a point, more people send him information because they see him as a serious actor in that in right. that space. Yeah. So was there a moment for your career where you were like? you know, wow, uh, I'm now getting a lot more maybe access or feedback or content from people because they know you as, as Kevin Wallerman. Probably, um, probably after we went to, uh, we went to Angola, Africa and followed a church quilt. And I mean, it was a weird story and I can't believe that DAY approved it. They didn't approve it for like four times. I went up there and they go, no, this is crazy. This is dumb. But we went to a little church north of um, Moorhead, and all the little church ladies make quilts every winter, and then they send them off to Minneapolis, and then they put them on a ship, and they send them to everywhere, Uh, poor people everywhere. So we went to that church, saw the old ladies making the quilt, and then we followed it all the way over to Angola, Africa. Well, what DAY didn't know, what I didn't know is there was an active civil war going on. And we landed in a refugee camp on a UN plane 
on a very direct descent because the war was going on and they didn't want to get shot down. So we landed, guys with machine guns everywhere, and we're here for this cute little quilt um, in this refugee camp surrounded by landmines. So all these people are walking around without limbs. And um, here's, you know, here we are from Fargo. How about it, guys? Wow. So I think after that documentary, that was kind of a game changer. And it was like, wow, we can do documentaries. So we started doing more and more of those. We did a, a really emotional one in Vietnam with troops returning for the first time. And um, so, yeah, it kind of that kind of changed things. And I think people, people, when you've been at a station for a long time, it's just longevity where they feel a connection and right. some trust. It's not like, wow, you're awesome. It's more like, hey, you've been there. We trust you. Right. What do you think of this story? Yeah, you're a known quantity. It, yeah, something like that. And I think they know that you're going to respect the subject at the same time, too. Yeah, because there's some touchy ones out there. We did one here a few months ago. I got a call from someone, and they said, I'm not sure we want you to do this story, but I want you to hear it, and s- what's your reaction to it? And it was a family that had lost a loved one at a senior care center, and they really questioned the care because they had passed away. And it was a good story, but I wanted to make sure, A, it was balanced, and it wasn't like a gotcha, we're going to go out there and get this nursing home. You know, it wasn't that. Mm-hmm. You know, gave the other side ample time to respond. What What do you think of this? And um, so when people can put their trust in a reporter, then it, you know, a story that's sad and whatever still can have an impact without wrecking people. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I like the fact that you use the term gotcha, too, because gotcha journalism, in my opinion, is is not f- fun. It's not no, a fun way to— it's not attractive. To, you know? It isn't, and, then, and you're not telling a story. You're telling, you're, you're telling a, a set of opinions. Right. You know, you're not allowing these things to kind of grow. Have you ever had a, a, a story or an assignment where you went into it and your mind was changed completely about a particular subject by the time you were done? Of course. In fact, I know of of two stories where they were semi-gotcha and interviews were shot, tape was shot, and never hit the air. Really? Didn't feel good about it. And, you know, at the time, I'm like, oh, are you kidding? You know, we worked hard on this and da 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 I'm glad we, you know, I'm glad we didn't. You know, and that's the that's the one thing I like about um, still having local control as far as ownership is you don't, you know right away if if it's a green light or a red light. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not citing any other stations here in town, but with so much national ownership of uh, TV stations nationwide, you know, it's like trying to get permission from the Pope right. to do something. And that's why I say a thing like documentary stuff. I can just call up and say, hey, I think this is cool. Can we go? Yes. All right. Um, you don't have that. All right. We got to fill out form E, F, slash L, and we'll send it to corporate, and we'll get back to you in uh, three months. Yeah. So. I mean, you're really in a very unique position, uh, especially at WDAY, with the fact that you can get that yes or no. You also have access to, you know, Gosh, the, the the really your your tool chest is almost endless, uh, which is just it's got to be great in that sense as a reporter to know like if there's something you really want and really need, there's somebody who can make a call on your behalf pretty quick. Right, may not get it, but at least we can find out. You know what right. I mean, or things like that. But you know, so much of this has changed. You know, with you know digital content and websites and podcasts like you guys and everything in the media world is just like, and I hate to be like the old man, like get off my yard. But in part, <laughs> part of me is like, you know, am I, am I keeping up? You know what I mean? There's always a part of me is like, am I one of those old guys that'll, you know, Hey, maybe Wolven, it's time you step down. <laughs> right. But you know, you try to keep up, but it's crazy because I don't know if you guys sit down and watch the six and 10 o'clock news. Cause if you do, you're kind of a rare breed in a way because a lot of young folks just aren't doing it. Right. I mean, if you get on a plane, people immediately your age are putting in their uh, headphones for podcasts. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, my coworkers, these young kids that are shooting uh, photographers, podcasts, 
You know, so few of them. I'm the only one reading the paper over there right now. <laughs> Is that amazing? Yeah. I can't think of a morning not starting with the paper. Good to hear. Yeah. Um. I even still. I even still read through the like want ads in the back because I'm always interested yeah. in knowing like, well, who's still advertising with, <laughs> exactly. the, you know, with this? I read the legals once in a while, <laughs> which is pathetic. But once in a while, you get a story out of it. To be honest, sure. Yeah. Once in a great while. I mean, for the most part. Oh my. If you recognize gosh. a last name yep. or something like that, right? sure. And uh, um, I love looking at the divorces. Do you? <laughs> just for fun, just to see who's single now. Just, just, just to be like, oh yeah, you thought that last. I knew it wouldn't. <laughs> I knew it wouldn't. <laughs> I wonder if they were going to give me my toaster back. <laughs> um, so you've also had the uh, great fortune of working with some pretty local legends, people who you know really put their stamp on on journalism. And I mean, you're right there yourself, Kevin. You're no slouch yourself. Yeah, um, that's interesting. You say that because I thought about that the other day. We're only on our um, our third anchor mail for six and ten o'clock news. Our third one is really? that amazing? Yeah, in Minneapolis they go through three in a month. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so whoever um, I believe it was Glenn Hansen or Ken Kennedy, I'm not sure, started in the when we started in fifty whatever it was, and then um, Marv and then Dana. Um, so that's it, yeah, that's it, it. it's an impressive roster of human beings. Uh, I got to know M- M- Marv's daughter babysat me when I was a little no kid. No kidding. Yeah. And so Kathy I, or Sherry or Kathy, yeah. Oh, fun. And uh, I remember getting to meet Marv for the first time, and he was just about to do one of his Truman Capote talks. Oh, of course. And so he, <laughs> he was using the Truman Capote voice, and I remember thinking, like, what a weirdo. You don't sound anything <laughs> like you do on TV. <laughs> uh, uh, he loved doing that, yeah. He Oh, he and he was a Jack force of Benny, nature. He did a good Jack Benny. Oh, I never heard his Jack. Oh, I mm-hmm. bet he did do a good Jack yeah. Benny. And he was, you know, when I was talking about that, I was pretty hopeless mechanically. He was far and above the most hopeless person when it comes to any of that <laughs> oh yeah oh <laughs> really well, he got his hand in a snow blower trying to clean it out once and ended up in a cast um i remember he got trapped under an apple tree mowing on his rider <laughs> the, the limb of the tree he was trying to duck but the limb of the tree kind of trapped him and he was on the mower and they they had a lake place where not far from where i grew up oh really so i'd go over there um once in a while, and and help him. He once burned his front badly. Um, he was making a ham, and he was using a he was using like a table fork to try to get it out of the pot. The ham came off the fork, splashed boiling water oh. all over his chest. Oh, oh yeah, There's, you gotta watch out for that hot ham yeah, water. It was, it was funny until you said boiling water, and then it's yeah. oh. But when you start with ham. That's the perfect right. Like I was trying to think, like, to like slices of ham. Is that <laughs> yeah. what, what fell down? Um, so is is it interesting being in at, at at a place where so many of these local legends have have been a part of it? Because you think of a trusted news source, and I actually I can't think of another station that has a better long like longevity mm-hmm. than WDAY when it comes to broadcast news. It is a staple in our house. My dad watched the six and the ten just in case something changed in between. Yeah. Isn't that crazy when you think back to I mean, because that was kind of a part of your day and night. As a family anyway, back in the sixties and seventies, grandparents, parents, you watched the news. That was just part of your day and especially the weather or to catch your hometown on this see that score you mm-hmm. know on on sports and then again that's all changed everyone's on twitter and boy you get it right now you get the weather right now um but yeah thinking back to and you know i just thought of that when i walked through the lobby on my way here we because i was looking uh for a picture of bobby v we have a a wall in our lobby with all of our old uh, radio and tv stars and um you know bobby v played a role peggy lee Sang for us. Uh, Frank Scott was our our staff pianist. He went on to the Lawrence Welk show, and so all these really cool entertainers that played live radio at the top of the Black Building downtown. Mm-hmm. That's where our studio wow. was then. Can you imagine that? Every day you had an orchestra, you had a pianist, uh, the incomparable Hildegard on the organ, and <laughs> and then these all these people that would come in that became kind of household names and celebrities for the radio. Right. And then they'd take it on the road and go to Castleton and, and um, you know, Jamestown and pack gymnasiums with all these entertainers. I just think back, what a cool time. What? Oh, yeah. yeah. What kind of, you know, 
archive exists of older broadcasts like that. I mean, I know, you know, it's at the start, you know, they don't even have the opportunity to necessarily record right. stuff so that it's just going out into the ether. And then even when you do, I know a lot of old stations would reuse tape all the time for yeah, cost. Yeah, that's a problem. Um, and I thought that we were, I thought we were horrible at it, but we have one, one guy at the radio station that has been there a long time. He's managed to save some of that. And I was reminded of it last week when one of our pioneer singers passed away at the age of 90 something. And he emailed out a, a digital clip of this guy singing along with, um, a, a co-star. Her name was Ginny Gordon. And this guy sounds like Bing Crosby to a T. Really? And she sounds like, I don't know, name a star from the 40s. That was incredible. But, I mean, this was recorded in the top of some, you know, crappy building downtown Fargo. And it's amazing, the quality and the, you know, their voice. And I think, you know, what was that like? And then they left to go on and do other things in their right, career. But, right. Yeah. Archiving is, yeah. You know, I always say if I won the the lottery, that's what I do, because even on the TV side, we've been able to archive stuff, but finding it is, you know, unless you pay big money to a company to archive all your TV stuff, there's a yeah. lot of TV stations that just chuck it, yeah. sadly. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it, you're, you're putting out hours of content oh every single day. Yeah. I mean, if you think about how much you shoot just for a, 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 a segment. Right. And how much gets you know thrown thrown away afterwards? Yeah, uh, and especially back in the days when you're you know you're working with pre video tape and stuff like that, I can I can understand how archiving can be really really difficult. But even today, I know you know for us we we've got an air check, and mm -hmm. if we are podcasting something from our show, that's that's about it. I'm not saving every chunk of every news right. broadcast. And yeah. sometimes I think we should be doing a better job of this. Well, and, and there's a part of me that's like, we need to feel responsible. And I'm not saying that to be like, oh, we need to be. But listen, TV and radio stations, we're, we're um, history recorders, right? Yeah. Right. So oh, yeah. when your kids and grandkids are wanting to learn more about the flood of 97, Guess what? They should be able to, I would hope, go online and watch those incredible stories of losing Oak Grove and losing Grand Forks and the fight to save Fargo and Ada going under and Watt Brett going under. So we have those. It's just not easy for you to find them. And I just wish it was, you know, a simpler, better way to access all that stuff because it's it's the history of our region, you know. So we really need to be cognizant of hanging on to that stuff. You know, if even if we just found an easier way to provide it to like NDSU, exactly like there are their archives are great and they've got oh, an almost incredible. endless amount of manpower to do those type of things. That's a great idea. Yeah. You know, so if at the end of every day we just send them an audio file and maybe a note or two of saying, hey, you know, this is good or this is good. Yeah, bada that's bing, true. Bada and boom. I think back, you know, they're especially their photos of right. Uh, when oh, yeah. We're doing history stories. We love going to their website and their uh, Horizons Digital. There's just great photos of downtown Fargo, and yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I I do archiving on my own as a hobby, and I got into it when I realized, you know, my family, we have 50-plus VHS tapes of home movies, and they're all becoming brittle because of the chemicals on them, and I ended up investing in sort of some equipment to do it. And uh, I just think it's really fascinating because it especially is. this old media, pre-digital, right. it's all physical yep. that are there are things that are deteriorating and I think about like, what would it have been like if we had videotape at the time of the civil war, right? If we could look back at footage Isn't from that, that time. Right. And now we actually have the ability to save something that people two, three, four, five generations down the line will be able to watch. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's mind blowing. And you're right about the, the, the tape. That's one reason we had to hustle here in the last couple of years to try to archive um cuz they were some of it was 3 quarter tape. Mm, yeah. So this was pre VHS, yep. pre beta and that stuff is like glass. Yep. It's brittle cuz it's it's uh, it's the chemicals on the tape. Yep. Just breaks down over time. In fact, uh in the last few months I've been making a point of getting like my documentary stuff over onto a external hard drive. Just to ha just so it's there, yeah. Um, and not on a tape and lost in 
whatever because yeah a lot of stuff gets thrown and we're we've got such a cool age now where you can find all these old movies i I think of what just happened uh at the beginning of 2019 with the public domain and the huge amount of content that became available yeah that's uh to people if someone took the time to archive it right right if not it's just you know disappeared into the to the ether as you right. put. How many stories have we heard of lost films? Right. That they just don't exist anymore as far as we can tell because right. no prints were ever saved. Even films that get remastered oftentimes they have to go back in and do some trickery because they there would be damage to the, the initial prints exactly. because yep. they were modifying them back there too. They didn't have the long game in mind. So it, it's, it's something that I, I hope more institutions that have media as an asset that have it in inside their ecosystem can find a way to digitize and then save those things in multiple places. Cause that's right. the only way you can actually ensure this will stay around forever, make it digital and then get duplicate it, it, get it, get it in multiple places. Did you see they took some world war one footage and colorized it here? That, that new documentary really? by, uh, yeah. by Peter Jackson. It's, it's fun. I need oh, to they, see it. They will, uh, I'm blanking on the name it's of it. It's got a they in it, I remember. But yeah, what they did was they went, they they redigitized all this old footage, they colorized it, and I think they even hired actors to fill in sounds for some of it to make it seem yeah, as Yeah, it'll give you the chills because it just it went from being kind of a black and white, oh, that's kind of neat to holy smokes. I did yeah. see a piece once on um uh I don't know which institution it was, it had a bunch of World War 1 footage. Mm. And but it has no sound, right? It was just newsreel footage that they had, and they were bringing in these people who were forensic lip readers. Oh, and wow. they were having them like watch like a ten second piece of footage over and over again, and then they'd say, "I think what he's saying is this," and then you say it, and you and you watch them speak, and you go, "It looks like that's probably what he's saying." So, however accurate that is, they're effectively lifting yeah. dialogue out of nothing, out of a visual image. Mm. Um, there's even stories about old vinyl records, like some of the first vinyl records with the really deep grooves oh, right. that they would do these ink pressings of. And I forget what school it was, but this university, they they had some of these old archived prints, but the records actually didn't exist anymore. But the print itself gave a complete copy of what the grooves looked like. And what they did was they basically recreated the image as like a vector file in Illustrator or something by tracing it. Then they 3D printed it and then played it. And it worked because those were just physical grooves that that tell you what the sound is supposed to be. They were able to lift music and sound out of a still image that was about 100 years old. That's unreal. Right? That's so cool. Like who figures that out? I know. Yeah. I... I'm so glad that there are people who are smarter than I am out there, <laughs> just on a daily basis. Um, so, it, you know, do you like watching docu- other documentaries? It's such a big part of your life. Yeah, I do. Um, and it's not like forgetting ideas or anything like that, but um, I love them because uh, time is taken to tell a story. Um, you know, it's funny, that Vietnam one I mentioned, this was before we had cell phones, I went over to Vietnam with a photographer because we were following a Fargo guy that was joining a group of veterans um, going to where they were in Vietnam during the war. And on the plane and within the first 24 hours, we figure out, well, on this plane are a couple of guys who survived just being slaughtered, their unit being slaughtered on the hill, including a wife and her son were along because her husband died on that hill as a medic, as a conscientious objector, and is one of three to ever win, not win, receive the Congressional Medal of Honor after he died. Wow. So that movie, that was big last year, the year before. Yeah, the... um, uh, Hacksaw Ridge. Yes, that guy is a recipient, and then this guy and one other. So anyway... I'm no longer following the Fargo guy, right? So I am hoping, all right, guys, I'm coming back to Fargo, and the one we're supposed to follow, kind of not really, because they they climb the hill when we were there. It's like a three-hour climb. They get to the top, and they relive the battle with the son and the wife hearing it for the first time. I mean, 
incredible. People are sobbing and it's 90 degrees, it's humid, and this story is incredible on how it unfolded. And behind us were some Vietnamese listening to this story. And afterwards, after all of this, they walked up to the group after things had kind of settled. And a couple of them had been there. Wow. In June of 1968. Unreal. Yeah, and they, 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 they had etched the names of those guys that had been lost that day um, at the wall in D.C., and then they, they burned them up there on the top of that hill. So super emotional, came back to Fargo, and I'm like, here's the deal, guys. We have a great, great documentary, but just so you know, it's not focused on the Fargo guy. I couldn't like pick up a phone and call. Sure, um, but that's a, that's out, yeah part of documentary filmmaking, right. though, right? Is right. Y- you're not in control of the story. Let it go. Yep. Exactly. That's you the story just of capturing to be... the Freedmans. Right. That's what happened with that film. Was these filmmakers were making a documentary on people who worked as child perform as as performers for child parties in New York City, mm-hmm. and there was this one guy who was a juggling clown, and they were like, "Why is this clown so angry?" And they find out that he's from a family where the father and his brother had been accused of, you know, molestation and maybe I can't remember, was it murder as yep. well? It just a, like the most heinous things you could imagine. Right. And there was all there was a heavy cloud over the um, investigation of it and stuff. And they realized, whoa, this is the documentary we should be making this guy wow. right here. Yeah. So that happens. That happens a lot. Uh, my buddy, Mike Schultz, who has made four documentaries now feature lengths with rip list coming out here pretty soon. I mean, he could talk all day about that where he's someone who I can tell he actually has to tell his brain to stop thinking of ideas for documentaries because wow. he's running into them all the time. That's neat. He's like, that would be a cool that's a film. Good that would be a great mm-hmm. film to have, but you know, only so much the, time of the day, you know, and that's the thing with shooting like local TV news documentaries is like when I was in Puerto Rico a couple months ago, we did a half hour documentary. We shot it in four days. Wow, that's insane. And got back to Fargo and then spent the next mm, four, four and a half days editing. You know, when other people do documentaries, they shoot it for two, three years. Yeah, right. And they have a couple years to edit and they've got 15 people. It's usually myself and a photographer. That's it. Right. So that's, that's kind of a challenge, but it can be a good thing too because you're very in control of... You know, you both you both are on the same page, right? Um, and but that's a daily thing. You you have to talk through with your photographer. How is this story going to look, so that you don't come back and go, "How come we don't have this? How come we don't have that?" So it's very a collaboration, you know. Um, but it's funny, like we've been out to New York for uh, murals and stuff like that, and the you know the big city folks are always like kind of looking at you, like, "What you guys do documentaries?" So it's kind of interesting to see how other cities, it's, it's not, it's foreign to them. Yeah. You know, they just don't do them. Well, I, like we mentioned earlier, you're in a really lucky position where you've got Very. local ownership who will be able to green light stuff for you uh, like that. And let's face it, going to Africa, going to Vietnam, these aren't cheap trips. No, they're not. And yeah, when you get back, you're you're grateful because it is costly. They can sell them usually and make up some of that. But yeah, especially those, yeah, Vietnam and Africa. But I tell you what, going going to Africa um, with Deb Dawson and her group and everything worked out on that. You know, so many things could have gone wrong. Traffic breakdowns, wild animals attacking, who knows? But everything just, it was seamless and it was such a story. And the photographer I had has now moved on to bigger things, is so talented the editing and photography in that was phenomenal. And that's why I mean it's such always a team effort. It's never like a reporter is, you know, the guy. But um it's yeah. a collaborative uh, it is. art. Well it is. And um that's what you know makes it fun. Great pictures and good stories. You know, the, these kids that Deb had had really saved and, you know, to see them do well and go to school and be safe. Yeah, but 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 also with documentary filmmaking, you are always surprised at the end of it because it's not like a you know a narrative feature where you write a script and you know how the movie ends and you have right. all these other types of control. You know, I've worked on a number of short documentaries, and it's basically you know your subject, you know the the message you think you're going to be presenting or getting, but then you're basically you know 
with a butterfly net hoping to catch a bunch of stuff and you get all this content. Right. And then and and which a lot of it is just happening in real time as you're covering whatever the story is. And then you go back to your edit bay and you go, okay, there's a story in here somewhere. Yeah. I need to dig around and find the story that's in there. And and that's what I like about news too is you you can't stage anything. You can't it's not like shooting a film. But with news you just you let it happen. Yep. Um, and you get to elicit that emotion without yeah. without having to create it. And that's what's great because we can say, you know what, just let this thing go for a little bit. And that can that can happen even in in TV news stories, you know, these little surprises and stuff. I was in Jamestown last Thursday <clears throat> and did a story on Hockey Day North Dakota. So it was like, all right, we show up, we shoot the rink, we talk with the organizers, someone from the team, da 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 da, da and we're pretty much wrapping up the shoot because you know we're out of town. It's for it's a same day turnaround, and uh, I saw this guy in coveralls sitting there, and I could tell he was into the project. I'm like, wow, you guys did a really great job. He's like, yeah. He said, I've got about 700 hours into this thing. I said, oh, okay. He said, do you got a you know what? Do you have a son who plays hockey or? He's like, well, he said I did. He goes that. That advertising over there, that's my company. He said, we we have a scholarship in his memory. And I'm like, oh, okay, what what happened? He said, well, he was 10 and he died in a plane crash in in southeast North Dakota a couple years ago at the age of 10. And um, I said, well, you know, can I just ask you some questions about, about him? Tell me about him. And he was more than happy to do that. And I just thought, what if I'd missed that? And, you know, that could have been a standalone story, right? I should have maybe made that my story and made the hockey tournament something little. But you know what? We put him in the middle of there of the story and made it kind of a surprise. And he was so eloquent and very emotional. But it also kind of brought it home like, here's a guy that his only child he lost, but he's willing to put in 700 hours of volunteer time to honor his memory. They were going to retire this kid's jersey at one of the games. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's really beautiful. And, you know, you find that a lot where people, and I may never see that guy again. And I bet half the people I interview in some pretty crazy situations, I bet I never see them again. But they just told me some of their innermost emotions. Losing a kid in a plane crash or a car accident or cancer what have you, losing your home to a tornado, a fire just took your business, and there we are with the microphone, and people are willing to, you know, kind of spill their guts and and share that information, yeah. I take for granted a lot that I'm in front of a microphone a lot. I get to be on stage quite a bit, and there's some people out there who never get to do that. I remember one time I purchased a new PA system, and I set it up in the garage just to test it out, just to you know see if all the cords were there and all the mic wire. And my mom said, "Could could I say something into the microphone?" Funny. And I thought about it, and I'm like, "Well, yeah, no problem. Why not?" And I really yeah, this is did. the first time she'd ever held a microphone right. in her life, and then heard what she sounded like amplified yeah. or whatever. And you know, she's a little afraid of it at first. Mm -hmm. And those are the type of things that. I guess, you know, sometimes we can take for granted, right? right. So th this gentleman who shared his story with you, not only is he sharing part of his grieving process in the celebration of his son's life, right. but he's doing it in front of a camera, which is, uh, I can't, I forget the name of it, but the fear of speaking in public, the number one fear that people have across the globe. When you put a camera and a microphone in front of somebody who's not used to that, that can be one of the most terrifying things in the world, but they are so open to sharing their story with you that they'll take themselves outside of their comfort zone they to do just to, that. Because they also get choked up. But, you know, you, you, you hear that in big cities, like, oh, do you know, did you, did you get someone to get emotional? And I'm like, totally not into that. No. I'm not. Um, I'm into letting something breathe, meaning if there's a very dramatic sound bite, I'll let that go a couple seconds. But I'm definitely not going to pounce on someone that's sobbing uncontrollably or something like that. And, you know, you see that in some TV markets. That's that's just really shoddy journalism, and it's, I, it's, I think. It's, it's a sticky, sticky wicket because 
just the act of editing images in sequence, creating a montage, mm -hmm. you are deciding, uh, you can call it manipulation if you want, although the word manipulation has a more negative connotation, but it is what you're doing. Exactly. You are deciding at what pace, in what order do people hear things. And so, it, yeah, you, you have to kind of strike a balance of, is this serving the story or is it serving some other prurient interest that doesn't serve the story? Yeah. Um, I, me and a bunch of my friends who are into filmmaking will have long conversations about the documentaries we've seen where they show a subject break down and start crying on camera, right? But they have every right to show it because they signed a waiver and they yeah. agreed to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's always then a question of did why did that happen? You know, is it important for the audience to see that to be able to fully empathize with the pain this person is feeling? Mm -hmm. Is it a cheap trick to get them right. to, to to get your piece to have more emotional resonance? Um, you know, we talk a lot about episode five of JJ Meets World with Rich Summer, who is an actor from Mad Men. He's a Concordia alum. Yeah, and I he, see him at church at Trinity. Yeah. Oh, there you go. He's a, and he's a great guy. Yeah. And he got really emotional when talking about the Concordia production of Equus. And, you know, in, in our piece, we don't have to edit anything. So we weren't, we didn't have to cross that mm -hmm. question of, do we put it in or do we not put it in? He was fully aware of it. But there's no question that when he bared his soul like that, it gave a weight to that episode that we couldn't have engineered. No, oh, that's huge. Yeah. That's just so, <clears throat> that's just such raw stuff. I remember getting some flack. This was 25 years ago. There was a horrible fire in Moorhead. And it wasn't even fire. It was just a smoky fire. But it killed a mom and her five kids. Ooh. Whoa. And, um, it, you know, it was so bad. The firefighters were just, they were overcome with emotion. And then we interviewed the grandma. And we were talking to her in her house, and the phone rang. And it was her son who called to see what was up. And she told him over the phone. She got very emotional and said, they're all gone. They're gone. And we used that. And I can get the criticism, because that was a pretty private moment. Um, you know, should we have been recording it even? On the other hand... From a journalism standpoint, it was incredible raw emotion from someone you were, and it really, it really created the picture of grief of losing these five kids. Um, she did, she didn't, she was not upset, but there were, I know there was at least one viewer who who called and thought we were taking advantage of the situation. I and I get it. I was just at a meeting yesterday at the forum. And while I was w waiting around in the lobby, they've got big printouts of previous oh, ones. Yeah. And there's the old tornado right? where it's a dead child is being carried mm -hmm. by a, I don't know if he was a neighbor, father or whatever. A neighbor. A yep. neighbor. And um, I mean, it's a very visceral image. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a dead child. And yeah. it was a massive image. Cal Olson took it. Okay, yeah. So I mean it's it's a it's a legendary image in the news and around here, but that's another question like do you know what right. do you do with that photo? Well, that won a Pulitzer, but guess what? Today we'd never run it. No. Absolutely not. Is not that a chance. No. Um I remember when uh are you familiar with the Elvaro Garza story? Yep. The kid I'm that, not actually. Kid uh fell through the ice on the Red River kind of by the Yemcomps area okay. or the old American Legion building. Fell through, went under. 40 minutes underwater in the middle of winter and everyone thought of course he had passed and we're on the banks of the river shooting the firefighters trying to find him with poles mothers next to us screaming and just weeping they hook him after 40 minutes they hook him well we presume that he's dead so our cameras immediately went up to the firefighter face when they dragged the kid in and, um, and then they went back down and to, to get him um, or to shoot the video of him in the boat. <clears throat> and we didn't use it the first three days because we assumed he was not going to make it. Well, he made it without any problem, no deficits. They did some amazing stuff. They warmed his body up and got him going. Wow. And anyway, so Nothing we did short of a miracle. Totally. So it wasn't until a year later we showed that. 
Um, there was a station in town that did show his lifeless body coming in the boat. Um, but back then, we had really, really strict rules on no no bodies, no body bags. You know, if you think someone has passed, there's absolutely no way you'd shoot that. Right, because so. you, you're at risk of further traumatizing the family, oh. the loved ones, for, for no r- really necessary yeah, journalistic need. <laughs> what is the information that's being gained from the public by seeing that yeah. that video? Um, I think wow. they sold the video that we had that no, we didn't use, but we had to like rescue 911 oh, or you know no, what I mean? Yeah. It was on their mm-hmm. open or something. Sure. I hope I, that kid's family got a cut. <laughs> yeah, Probably not. Well, they raised a lot of money here. I So I think of how tight knit we are as a community here and how much we celebrate and grieve for complete strangers who just happen to share the same area code. Right. And so, you know, in the situation you brought up about the the grandma talking to her son on the phone with, you know, they're all gone. In a way, she's saying that to her son, but she's also saying it to the community as a whole. That's true. Because we're all, you know, we all get into this moment of grief. I remember people openly weeping when they heard um, that Dennis Wallacher had passed away. Right. And they had probably never met him. They yeah. never got a chance to, you know, hang out with Denny. Right. But they felt so connected to him in what he b- represented in our community that they needed to cry, which is why, it, it, you know, his funeral was enormous. Yeah. I mean, busting at the seams. Even with, uh, uh, I think, of uh, Rusty Castleton's funeral. Yep. Right. Yep. Rusty Castleton was another person who was larger, larger than, than life. life. And we, even though you might not quote unquote have the right to be involved in you know in that person's personal private life, mm-hmm. you still need that closure that's a part of it. And so, I can see I would have done the same thing if I had had the opportunity to air that footage because it's part of that healing process. And, yeah, and I also find it strange now, simply after uh, being around in the business thirty five years. It's kind of weird you're covering some of these emotional, intense stories, and you know them, you know, simply because mm-hmm. you're involved in this or that or the other thing. And so that always gets to be kind of a crazy situation. Too. Has that been something you've run into where you're about to tell a story and then you find out that you actually know personally people who are affected by it? Involved Oftentimes with it? before I, I go into it, like okay. before I make that call, it's like, oh, I know this family, um, you know, and they just... This just happened to him. And, you know, you reach out to them and say, you know, I regret making this call even, but, you know, can you talk to us about it? Right. Sometimes they are willing. Sometimes they're not. And, I, you know, you get that. I was heavily involved with uh, when my friend Jared Nillis died. He died in a train accident uh, just outside of Buffalo River State Park. And it was... It was a big story that day, yeah. and it was a story for the next kind of week and a half until the toxicology results came back. And getting to be on that other side and saying like, "Well, we just we want privacy," yeah. and have you know having that honest conversation of this is getting covered whether you're a part of it or not. Yeah, and so if you don't want to be a part of it, we're going to we'll go on Facebook and see if we can find someone who wrote on his wall who'd be willing to talk to us. Mm -hmm. Which is what happened. I mean, I got contacted by by reporters because I had wrote, you know, R.I.P. Nilly. And so they were like, well, you you knew him. What do you have to say about him? Yeah, that's often. And I think the the hard part for me was the people who reached out to me kind of were, without coming out and saying it, saying like, listen, you should be the person to say this. Don't don't let all of these media outlets find just anybody and that happens to yeah. do that and so i think that's a tough thing for people mm-hmm. to realize but there's no malice it's not like you're going out there to be like well i'm trying to figure out i'm trying to gotcha on whatever this happens to be right. and thank goodness those people came out and i can think of tammy swift was mm-hmm. one of the people who was just the most gracious and kind of said i'm going to give you some time these are the questions i'm going to ask yeah, you know, just yeah. it's not you answer as freely as you want to, and if you don't, you know, if you don't want to answer that question, just say I would prefer not to answer that question. It can right. be very easy to view it as opportunism when, in reality, it's a byproduct of the enormity of the situation. Yeah, you know, how do you ignore something that's as tragic as that that the community that you live in is is digesting in some way? And it's funny with social media, 
it feels better and it's easier for the reporter to reach out on a Facebook or Twitter and say, can you call me as opposed to the old days? All right. There's the Johnson family in the phone book. There's the number. I'm calling Dad. I hear he works address. at this place. You know, I'm going to catch him then. Because, for you know, in in the case that you mentioned, if close friends are willing to talk, hey, we're good. We're not going to bug the family. Right. You know what I mean? And so, in in some cases, that works uh, to talk with friends like that that are willing to post something on Facebook. Have you it? With as long as you've been in journalism, it must be interesting to cover stories where, let's say, a, a business is opened and then also cover now that business being handed over to the next generation. And you've seen, you've really seen the progression in history of Fargo. I mean, let's face it, when you started at WDAY, it was 30, St. Luke's. Uh, you know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. Stuff like Luke's. that. 32nd Avenue, what's that? No <laughs> yeah. one's ever going to live further exactly. south than that. Gaffney's typewriter? Yeah. They <laughs> yeah. came to our place once a week and cleaned our typewriters. Where do right? you go to school? Fargo Central. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not not quite. Not no. close, but not yeah. quite. Um, what was World War One like? I'm just exactly. going to keep going back in time. <laughs> just keep going yeah. back in time. Um but so that has got that's got to be interesting to think of you well, you've covered the history of of Fargo Moorhead West Fargo. It's funny you say that. Deal On last Friday I was speaking to a group and uh they had a luncheon or whatever and the lady in the kitchen brought over the bowl of soup. I said, "Well, thanks. This looks really good." And she goes, "You know, it's the least I could do." She goes, "You did a story on my daughter 25 years ago when she was a baby and needed a liver transplant." I'm like, "Wow, that's really cool." And then she told me She's now whatever years old and is uh, working in this industry doing well. I love hearing those stories. Yeah. That's awesome. Or, um, you know, some kids I maybe did a story on and now they are, maybe they were, a, you know, a sick baby, a sick kid of some kind, and now they're like an RN in the children's hospital. Um, or Parker Siebens, the, the young boy, he lost his arms in that farm accident mm-hmm. in Milner. He was three. And... Last summer, I went to his wedding. Oh, wow. So stuff like that. That's awesome. I love, you know, when I can, you know, you get an invitation in the mail of a kid you covered 20 some plus years ago. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, I'm going to, I want to ask about this too, before we run out of time, you must have had an opportunity or two to go on an honor flight trip, I imagine. Amazing. Um, I I only know individuals who've gone on them. Yeah. Uh, I, for instance, the previous guest, Dave Brunswold Jr., right. his dad has yep. been very active in it. And everybody I've talked to about that says, you really can't understand what this is like and the amount of respect that are mm-hmm. given to these vets when they arrive in D.C. It's crazy. I mean, police escorts. And, you know, I remember at the uh, World War II memorial, uh, there's always a million foreign or international visitors and many, many um, Asians, folks from Japan and whatever. They will bow to these guys wow. um, and just the m- utmost reverence and wanting their pictures taken with them. High school kids wanting their pictures taken with them. You know, one of the stories that just sticks with me is I profiled, we called them the Helmucky boys, north of Moorhead from Georgetown. Five brothers served in World War II. Eight boys were in the service, but five served in World War II. So imagine this mom. Five of her kids are off in who knows where. Not sure if they're dead or alive, right? Well, um, fast forward, two of them or three of them wanted to go on an honor flight. So we're, we were doing a documentary on this. So I needed some pre-stories, some pre-shooting. So we went to um, one of the nursing homes and interviewed two of them and got things ready for the trip. Two days before the trip, one of the brothers dies. And so a grandson's like, I was going to escort grandpa. I don't think I can go. And now the other brother doesn't want to go because of the funeral, da 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 So we're like, oh, that's horrible for this family. And from a reporter standpoint, there goes one of my huge angles for the documentary. Mm-hmm. Well, we're getting ready to get on the plane. Here comes some of the family. They changed their mind. And they get to the honor flight. They're at the Korea War Memorial. They take out the funeral flag from oh, all man. of it Lutheran and lay it at the base of the Korean uh, the wall. And all these people that, you know, they don't even know are weeping. 
and the family's crying. And it was just this beautiful moment of this family paying the respects to this, you know, this guy who was so dead set on coming and then um, passed away. Just a, a great guy. But yeah, those stories stick with you. I hope you both can go on one of them one day. It's I, quick, it's quick but very emotional. I told him, I'm like, listen, anytime that you have a volunteer that you need for this, I will be there uh, with literal and figurative bells on if need be because I find it to be such a respectful thing and to be such an important thing. And, you know, you, you, this story is so touching because you know, he passed away right before this trip. And I know that's the urgency of these trips right now is that right. some of these individuals don't have a year or two to wait. All the World War II guys that have gone on honor flights, 80% of them are no longer with us. Yeah. And what's amazing is the the stories you watch of daughter escorting dad, son going with dad. So stuff that's never been broached or stories never been told, that's when it happens. There's oh, a, wow. That's when it happens. There's a phrase, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it a bit, and maybe one of you knows the correct wording of it. It's something about we, we die two deaths. The first is when we die, and the second is when the last time our name is spoken by someone. Mm-hmm. Um, that That is... Another reason why I think having the ability now to archive this footage right. that exists is so important. Yeah. Because um, for some people, I mean, you know, maybe this isn't realistic to think of it this way, but in my mind, that's them uh, bypassing that second death. Mm-hmm. You know, I I'm on a holy grail hunt myself right now for footage of a, of one of my grandfathers uh john mcdonald who used to be the president of like the north dakota teachers association mm. and i once found this photograph in an old book of him at like the north dakota democrat convention and in the I don't know, 50s i think right. and it's a photograph of him standing in front of a camera holding a microphone speaking into this camera wow i don't know who was shooting the footage right. i don't i there's a very good chance of it doesn't even exist anymore right but if I could ever find that, that, be cool? that would be the oldest sound footage of my grandfather speaking yeah. into a camera. You know, I would. There's nothing more that I would love to give my mom and her siblings than this footage of their dad. It'd in be the fun 50s. to find the year and yeah. then match what city the because it must have been an annual convention. It was an annual convention, and I've <clears throat> I've been in in uh, contact with some folks in Bismarck, mm-hmm. um, but a few years ago. I need yeah, to get if you in can contact narrow it with down them. To the city, then you can narrow it down to what TV stations were actually functioning because right. your best bet will be a KFYR or a DAY. Right. And, yeah. you know, and if that, if it was it, a local thing, does it exist? Yeah. Was it someone else? And, you know, this was the fifties. So this was sh- shot on film. Yeah. And who knows if that exists anymore, but well, that's those, cool. those things are out there. And, and if you can preserve them, do it because they are so precious. There are so many films and footage and photographs of, of, of people who had historic importance that are just gone. And we could be looking at them today, but we're not. We, we've lost it. It's gone to time. Well, I know one of my first stories is archived, and that's in South Fargo. Firefighters, two days, tried to get BJ the cat to come down. Oh, BJ. <laughs> Did they get him? They got him. And All right, BJ. <laughs> and that, that story is archived. I found it. I'm not proud of it, but I found it. You so that would be, be like at the, at the retirement party. It would be like, and we found I'm some sure. of Kevin's first work. Oh. Here we go, everybody. And it's it's an ugly one, but <laughs> hey, it works. It just it, that just goes to show, as you mentioned earlier, some ta- days it's really hard to oh. come up with what that story is <laughs> yeah. going to be. That, that showed it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I hear there's a cat in a burning building oh. two doors down. Uh, one of my favorite things is when they show what quote unquote rural television in like a movie. Uh, oh, there's yeah. a show called Thirty Rock where they go down to Georgia and they're in a small town in Georgia, and the news reports are like. Eileen Douglas is taking a trip up to Mobile, and she hopes that Alice will water her plants. <laughs> and now on to sports. It's uh, always a plaid jacket, yep. too, with a big tie. I love looking at pictures of old newscasters and just seeing what the facial hair was of oh, the yeah. era, because some of them are amazing. Whether the, the Boyd, mutton, Boyd had the big pork chop. Yep. Boyd Christensen, yep, yep. in sports. <laughs> You kind Fantastic. of wonder, like, what was it like? What was it like to work in hair and makeup back in, back in the day, huh? Oh, man, yeah, and, and the and our women on radio and and television had the giant beehive. Um, we had an afternoon live show 
And so the the hostess there, she was known for her for her hair. You know, which bring, is like, on. We, we gotta we gotta bring this camera back about three more feet yeah, exactly. to be able to get the whole shot uh, <laughs> yeah. going on. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much oh, this was for a blast. joining us thank today, you guys. Congrats on this show; it's awesome you do it. And thank we're you, archiving Brady. it now, so this is great. It's there. Oh yeah, forever. Um, if people want to see more of your work and find out uh, more about you, uh, are you on the are you on the twitters? Yep, I'm on Twitter, Facebook. Um, I have the documentaries on YouTube uh, under Kevin Wallavan. So if you Having trouble sleeping one night, you can watch some, some be, of the documentary you'd be, work. You'd be surprised. It's got some good stuff. And mm-hmm. also, I love how you casually mentioned earlier, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like when you go to the Murrows, no big deal. Like, <laughs> oh, you, the Edward R. Murrow Awards? Like, yeah, just yeah. like, just Courage. glaze over that a little bit. I call it a good excuse to eat some awesome food in New York. <laughs> there you go. On someone else's dime, right? <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, guys. <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode of JJ Meets World and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes every week, you can donate to our Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate today. Even as little as a dollar a month can go a long way. Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or hit up our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram all the sites the kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, go to linebenders.com, and you can find direct contact info for JJ. Hammers come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, but my favorite for those hard-to-do projects is an MC hammer. 